In the never-ending quest to give runners more data and more reasons to upgrade and spend money on smartwatches, companies are squeezing every bit of information they can into their watches. Ground contact time, recovery rates, VO2 max, race predictions, and more. The unfortunate part is, not only are most of these measurements useless because they rely on imprecise formulas or data measurements, but they can actually be a huge detriment to your training. So in this video, I'm going to show you the science on why smartwatch data like VO2 max measurements are probably wrong, why even a correct VO2 max can't predict your race performance. So stay tuned if you want to learn how to make the best use of your data that your running watch is giving you. Let me show you an example of my VO2 max measurement. At first glance, this is pleasing to the eye. You might say, look, I'm in the purple, the highest tier in the watch. Let me bask in my fitness. You might even think I'd be happy. But then I see this, hmm, that looks a little fishy. So let me explain. Here are my actual race performances. For the 5K, 1359. For the 10K, 2840. For the half marathon, 10517. And for the marathon, 22059. So come on. I haven't lost that much fitness, not even close. So put simply, the VO2 mats metric on your watch is wrong and it means next to nothing. Now, I'm sorry if I'm using this to direct your training, but it's impossible to predict your VO2 max and more importantly, your race times from your watch. So how far off is the Garmin watch VO2 max measurement? I showed you my actual race times before, so now let me share with you my actual VO2 max. I'm also gonna let you on a little secret. A higher VO2 max does not equal faster race performances. Let me give you an example. In college, I participated in a research study within our kinesiology program. As part of that study, a few of the athletes were asked to perform a lab-driven VO2 max test. My result, 84.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. After my test, the researcher paused and told his colleagues to remember this day because they would never see a higher VO2 max subject again. I won't lie to you, this was fuel to my pride. I paraded that piece of paper around like Charlie Bucket with his golden ticket. My teammate, who also participated in the study, scored a 72 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Based on the considerable difference in our test scores, you would think that a higher VO2 max would equal greater performance. However, my teammate beat me in every single race that year. So why is this? Well, I have a superhuman VO2 max. I should have left him in the dust. Yet, not only did I lose to him, but I regularly found myself mid-pack in most races. So while on paper, my VO2 max is extraordinary, I was very much a ordinary college athlete. So how could I, with a VO2 max higher than some of the greatest athletes of all time, not compete as one? This gets into why VO2 max does not directly correlate to race times. So while I have a greater ability to take in oxygen, my teammate has a better ability to use and sustain his oxygen. This is referred to to as having a greater running economy. Now in this example, running economy tells us that at a set pace, my teammate needs less oxygen than I do to sustain the same speed. During the self 2 marathon project formed by Nike, researchers witnessed an inverse relationship between VO2 max and running economy. Those who had high VO2 maxes were less economical than those with a high economy had lesser VO2 maxes. In my case, 84.5 suggests that I could take in a lot of oxygen. Unfortunately, my body is rather inefficient at being able to use that oxygen. So in essence, my engine is huge, but I'm running on diesel, while my teammate's engine is smaller, and but he's using a sleek electric car. So how does this make my VO2 max and VO2 max training obsolete? Well, yes and no. And this is where many runners get it wrong when it comes to using smartwatches to track VO2 max data. The problem is you target your training to improve this number. You run a few VO2 max workouts, the number on your watch goes up and you think that you're getting fitter, but your actual race specific fitness is getting worse. In short, you shouldn't train to just increase your VO2 max score. You should implement VO2 max work to complement your race specific distance. Now, so what are these some of these specific workouts that can complement your races? Well, let's talk about first VO2 max for the 5K. Out of the most common race instances, VO2 max is most important for the 5K. While the first portion of 5K training will focus on aerobic endurance, the last third or last quarter of your 5K training plan will emphasize VO2 max workouts. And think of this as the roof of the house of training that you're building. A few excellent examples of 5K specific VO2 max workouts, 12 times 400 meters at one mile to 3K race pace with 130 to two minutes rest, 12 times 300 meters at 5K race pace with 30 to 40 seconds 
minutes rest, or if you like hills, five times three minute hill repeats with a jog down recovery. Now, what about VO2 max workouts for the 10K and half marathon? The specific demands of the 10K and half marathon aren't heavily reliant on VO2 max, but it is still an important component to round out your fitness. In the 10K and half marathon, you should have a VO2 max workout scheduled every two to three weeks to keep the system in check and support others' energy systems such as aerobic development and threshold training. My favorite workouts to blend into 10K training are 16 times 400 meters at 5K to 10K pace, with every fourth 400 at one mile to 3K pace, with 60 seconds rest between the reps. Four miles, continuous tempo, alternating 400 meters at 3K to 5K pace, and 1200 meters at marathon pace. Or once again, if you like hills, four times two minute hills with jog down recovery, one mile on a flat surface at 10K pace, and then four times two minute hills with jog down recovery. Now what about VO2 max for the marathon? Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how much you like lung busting intervals, VO2 max is not a big component of marathon training. However, it is still useful and important to include some VO2 max workouts and speed workouts in your training plan every four weeks or so to help your form and efficiency. My marathon go-tos are as follows. Two sets of 10 times 400 meters at 5K pace with 200 meters jog rest and 400 meters between each set. Or two times 200 meters at mile to 3K pace with 200 meters jog recovery. Finally, six times three minutes at 3K to 5K pace with three minutes walk or jog recovery between. These should be used sparingly, mostly at the beginning of your marathon training plan. If your goal is to run a faster 5K, VO2 max training will serve to directly influence your speed and strength. If your goal is to run a marathon personal best, you may want to include VO2 max workouts to support the heavy aerobic demands you work to do early in the training plan once every three to four weeks. Now ultimately, VO2 max is just one of the many components of successful endurance training. It can be a helpful representation of aerobic conditioning, but it comes with other limitations. Just like every component of your training, it shouldn't be the sole focus of your preparation, but rather a small piece of the overall bigger picture. So make sure you don't really listen to that data on your watch and run to make sure that you're getting better for your next race. Good luck and thanks for listening.